Hello folks, I'm Doss Kamhout. I work in Intel IT, principal engineer. I'm here with Don Duggar, who works in our Open Source Technology Center. And we are here to talk to you about uh, Intel's work uh, with, with OpenStack. So first of all, I want to give you an overview of what uh, Intel uh, does with OpenStack. Uh, some of you may know we, we make CPUs, uh, we make silicon, we also make software. And we also have a, a pretty long uh, standing history of helping in the, in the open source uh, industry. Um, Don's going to give you a lot of details on that, but just if you look across the three areas where we're focusing, one's in our contributions. Uh, we now made it into the, in the top ten uh, contributors uh, as part of Grizzly, um, and Don's going to explain a, a lot of the details on, on what that is and what it is that we're doing. Um, the second point is, is for my neck of the woods, and this is uh, how we actually utilize the technologies. Uh, so many, many years ago, uh, we were one of the, the large drivers um, in the EDA silicon environment for moving from, from Unix to Linux. So we invested heavily in Linux. Uh, we're in the same situation here where we're moving uh, very aggressively forward and utilizing open source capabilities for what we do with cloud computing. Uh, we've been running a cloud environment for, uh, for quite a few years. Uh, my background's in grid computing where we uh, are heavily using Linux and other open source capabilities. Uh, so what I'm going to do is give you some uh, overview of what we do with Intel IT's open cloud. Uh, we shared quite a few details in the last summit, so I'm just kind of going to give you an update and so we can spend some more time on saying uh, Intel's uh, other contributions. And the third element is a thing we have called cloud builders. And these are basically uh, blueprints, blueprints, reference architectures on how to stand up uh, a cloud uh, environment. So we invite uh, various solution providers um, to, to come in and basically prove out step by step this is actually how you build a cloud um, so that other IT shops or other system integrators can basically take those blueprints, uh, bring them into their own environment, and walk through the steps of actually uh, building uh, a private cloud. So our focus is uh, you know, enabling enterprises and cloud service providers uh, with uh, open, open source capabilities for cloud. So uh, this is uh, some of the key Intel uh, contributions. And uh, again, Don's going to go into much more details on this. Um, if you look on the left, you see the specific contribution, uh, which project it is, uh, what the release, and, and some of the comments. So um, everything from uh, trusted filters, uh, trusted filter UI. Um, so these are based on a thing we have called trusted compute pools. Um, for those of you that are involved in, in security of hypervisors, uh, you're probably familiar with uh, things like rootkits or, or being able to uh, determine is that hardware actually secure, is that hypervisor secure. Um, so this technology, uh, which Don will give more details on, is basically how do you ensure uh, that environment can be trusted uh, for specific high security workloads. If you work in the enterprise IT space, you would find that uh, in some situations people actually don't virtualize uh, certain workloads just because of the risk uh, that still exists in regards to hypervisor technologies. And if you follow what some of the research environments are doing, they've actually found ways uh, to hit other VMs sitting on the same hypervisor through various attack vectors. So we'll talk about uh, what we do with trusted compute pools. Uh, we have a filter scheduler, so this is an intelligent scheduler uh, for Cinder. Um, so you'll see we're, we're basically investing in a lot of the, the core capabilities um, that are associated usually uh, with the hardware. Uh, multiple publisher port support from Cielometer. Uh, I always mess that up. Uh, open the Testation SDK, which is related to the uh, trusted compute pools, and Cosbench, uh, which is basically a way to do uh, uh, benchmarking against an uh, object store uh, environment. Um, so those are the high level points and uh, what Don's going to take you through is, is all the details. Thanks, Des. Um, yeah, um, one of the first things that we started to work on uh, in open source, uh, excuse me, not open source by any means, uh, OpenStack, was creating something we call trusted compute pools. And the basic idea is Intel has a technology called TXT, Trusted Execution Technology. And that enables you to verify that what you're trying to boot is, is what you wanted to boot. Okay, basically what it does, it uses the TPM, the Trusted Platform Module, to store um, unique keys associated with each of the elements that you're trying to boot. And as you boot up, you measure what you're trying to, uh, try, trying to boot, compare it with the keys in the TPM, and only if they match and you know your stuff is good, then will you execute it. So utilizing this, you can verify the BIOS, the boot block, the, uh, boot, the, the initial boot code, all the way up through the initial um, operating system that you're trying to run. 
So this gives people the confidence that, um, yes, you are booting the, the appropriate software, you've got a valid thing, and everything's working, pro and you know, everything is there properly. Um, one of the other major advantages of this is, uh, it's on the list as the compliance issues. This gives you a way of verifying to third party, you know, uh, whatever, that yeah, we booted properly, so if you know, something goes wrong, it wasn't because we booted the wrong software. We can guarantee you that. <laughs> so, um, and this kind of goes into um, the details of how um, we actually implement that. And you notice at the top, we're talking about um, the things that had to be put into OpenStack proper. There you'll see the, um, the, the, the yellow things are the things that we've added, okay, in order to support trusted compute pools, where um, one of the major issues was the trusted filter, that big oblong thing there. It's just a filter as part of the scheduler filters that basically when you say start me a virtual machine, um, I will go find the host that that machine is going to be running on and I will say, is that host a trusted host? And we have, you'll notice in the center, the attestation service. The attestation service is an external, pro uh, external process that runs and a service that runs that you can query to say, this is a host, is it trusted or not? And um, we've got uh, various protocols and whatnot in place so that if you look down at the bottom where you're actually running a host, this is where you have to have the boot, the, the host boots up, it runs the TXT. I'm trying, I'm pointing on my screen here and I'm sorry that I, I don't have a pointer up there. So you'll have, you'll have, you'll have to read through the, this slide and hopefully you can find the things I'm pointing at, virtual pointing. Um, it, 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 it boots and it executes the TXT code to guarantee that you're booting the right thing. And then there's a, there's a trousers module, which is part of the boot thing, uh, part of the, the processes that run that it talks to um, the attestation service and through a well-defined protocol, it'll exchange keys and guarantee that what you did is what you thought you were trying to do. Oh my gosh, yeah, I should have a pointer, thanks. Okay, yeah, there we go. Yeah, let me see my, my now, now, now I've got through that and that's probably the last one I'm, I'm, I'm going to be pointing at, I, I can point at it. <laughs> So that, that, that in, in kind of a nutshell is, 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 the, is, is the guts of how we do it. And, you know, we had to put in the trusted filter. And we also, I, did, I didn't mention that, we did put in some uh, enhancements to the Horizon UI so that you can actually see, okay, this is a trusted host. This is not a trusted host. It helps, it helps to be able to, to know, know those things. Okay. Now we're kind of, kind of, kind of, kind of switch gears a little bit. And now we can try and talk about Cosbench. Um, uh, Cosbench is a cloud object storage benchmark. Um, we're kind of an engineering company, and to an engineer, if you can't measure it, it doesn't exist. Okay, so um, we really haven't seen too many really great benchmarks floating out there. So uh, we decided to create one, and the first thing we're uh, attacking is uh, the ability to measure how fast your object storage is working. So we've we've built a framework, okay, that uh, has the ability to uh, deploy an appropriate uh, set of um, <coughs> a, a appropriate set of servers and whatnot, and then have uh, deploy some uh, benchmark um, processes that will extract data from the servers and measure the bandwidth and whatnot that you're uh, you're getting. And you can utilize this to to find 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 bottlenecks in, in in your particular environment to see whether or not different hardware is doing different things properly for you and do all that kind of stuff. I, you know, as I say, if, if, if you can't measure it, it doesn't exist. So now you're going to have a chance to measure it. And we will, be, we will be enhancing that in the future, hopefully hitting other things. I mean, I'd certainly like to, like to measure things like how is the compute nodes doing? I mean, are you, are you, are you hitting those things properly? Um, we're very big into networking. I expect to see networking measurements and whatnot coming down the line. Um, again, this, 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 this gives you kind of an architectural picture of the way Cosbench works, where the important thing is um, you have the controller up here, which is running things down through and hitting uh, the storage system. And it's all web-based so that, you know, it's very easy to, easy to utilize, easy to measure things, easy to um, find out how, how the stuff is going. And um, I, should, I, should, I should also emphasize that um, I work for the Open Source Technology Center here. 
Everything we do is open source, okay? So we might have created CauseBench, and I don't even know if it's, I don't know if it's been uh, officially released in the public yet, but it will be, okay? We, we are not, we're not in the business of creating proprietary solutions, at least in my division. So uh, expect to see that available, and you can grab it, do whatever you want with it, utilize it, modify it. We love modifications, those are wonderful. Um, Okay, another thing that we've been working on um, is the filter scheduler for Cinder. Now, for those of you that are familiar with uh, Open, OpenStack and the Nova scheduler, this will look remarkably familiar, <laughs> okay? In point of fact, it's almost exactly familiar, the same. The, the basic idea is you create a set of filters, and we've, these filters are pretty much analogs of the same filters that you'd see in Nova. But now what we're doing is we're applying these to Cinder so that you can filter, um, these filters says, um, this particular storage service is not appropriate for the particular benchmark I want, uh, for the particular workload I want to run, or this particular server is appropriate. And so the filter will make that decision for you. And then we have a weighting function that will go through and try and decide which of those, um, which of those, um, storage servers, you know, past the filters, which of those is better than the other. And based upon that, you'll get a rank ordered set of services, servers uh, for your storage. And so this enables you to control better um, how you place your storage, how you access your storage, and hopefully you can optimize your system and get it working in a much better fashion. It basically gives you more control over what's going on. And this just gives you an idea of how you can utilize these things to start with set of services and which are the appropriate um, storage servers that you want to go and um, uh, supply those services. Um, the multi-publisher for Solometer, um, I actually got that right, so there. Uh, <laughs> the idea here is you, ha you, you, you have a set of data that's going into, a set in, into the collectors and you want to transform that data, and it might be, might, might be one person wants to look at raw CPU counts, but another person might want to only look at CPU percentages. Okay, so you might want to transform that data into different uh, forms for different consumers. And then somehow you have to get that data to different, uh, diff different users of the data. There might be somebody that wants to measure the data for performance monitoring purposes, somebody else wants it for billing purposes, Somebody else wants to use it for historical trend uh, type analysis and whatnot. So you have, to get that, you have to get that data to multiple consumers. And so we put in some code into uh, the solometer to en enable just that. You can take basically one set of data, transport it in multiple different ways, and then send it out to multiple different con consumers. Um, yeah, and to talk about some of the future things that uh, we want to look at, uh, we at Intel are very, uh, you know, we're very, very, um, very in, uh, intent upon enhancing OpenStack. We think it's a really great thing. So we have other things that we want to do to it uh, going forward. Um, enhance platform awareness. That's actually something that I'm, I'm kind of working on. Uh, the idea is we want to enhance OpenStack so it can be aware of maybe some unique features <coughs> available on different nodes and so that uh, you can uh, utilize those different features in the most efficient and most uh, performant uh, fashion possible. Um, I, kind of as a side note here, um, I should emphasize, you know, we, I work for Intel. You know, I think Intel makes the best products, so that's why we're going to win. Um, uh, the enhanced platform awareness is not an intent to say, oh, this is only Intel, so you know, everybody else forget about it. We're enhancing the platform awareness across the entire ecosystem. If AMD can take advantage of this and utilize it, that's fine. Uh, we don't mind that much because our stuff is going to be better, so who cares? Um, so I, I just want to emphasize that a little bit. Um, another uh, area that we're going into, uh, again, in the future is key management. Uh, the idea here is uh, we're very concerned about security. The, the whole thing about the trusted platform, uh, trusted compute pools was a security issue. Uh, key management, again, is uh, a part of the sole security thing. And now we want to uh, start looking into what can we do to secure the data that you're, that, that you, the, you're utilizing. Um, again, we have a slightly, slightly biased view. We've got some in, uh, encryption instructions buried in the CPU, so we think it might be a good idea to utilize those things. Again, we think we have the better solution. But, you know, 
we want to enhance the key management just in general so that everybody can take advantage of it. Um, another thing to go along with kind of the storage stuff we've been talking about is erasure code. Currently in Swift, Swift does a triple duplication of your entire data set, which is fairly um, uh, exp expensive, shall we say, and wind up with a fairly sizable data explosion. Uh, erasure code is effectively um, the ability to only store certain portions of it and duplicate certain portions of it without duplicating the entire thing in three different places and still give you reliable capabilities so that if one of your storage servers goes away and loses your disk, you can still recover the data without necessarily having to go through a full uh, triple replication. So expe expect to see more work coming out from Intel in that area. Uh, and that is kind of where we are now. I'm going to give you a, a flavor for where we're going in the future. You know, things could change, but that's kind of a flavor for where we're going. And Das will now try and hopefully tell you exactly how we're doing things. Thanks, Tom. Uh, so I know there's some new faces. Uh, last, last summit, I shared quite a bit of details on uh, what we do with cloud, why we do cloud, and uh, a lot of the specifics on what we're doing with, with OpenStack. Um, this is intended to be an, an update uh, from that. Uh, but just a, just a couple things. This is our, our platform solution stack. Um, so if you look at the bottom, uh, there's a few things to look for. Uh, green means that it's something that we have in production today. Uh, yellow means that it's uh, coming in probably the next uh, uh, two months or so. Um, and blue is uh, a little bit later, though probably with quantum, uh, we're going to pull that in uh, fairly quickly since we, we really need it. So, so fundamentally on, on the far right, what you see is the, the release cadence. And uh, this is something, at least some of my enterprise IT peers uh, used to be kind of concerned with the fact that uh, OpenStack comes out with a new major release every six months. Uh, we actually think that's a really, really good thing um, because we need the pace to be ver very, very quick. Uh, I recall uh, six months ago, there was just a, a thought that maybe Cinder could have multiple storage uh, backends, um, and now it's a, it's a reality. So the reason that's a reality is because we're at this very fast cadence. Uh, there's some in the environment that say six months is even too slow. If you look at some of the pu public cloud service providers that you know, put out 150 features in one year, um, something like OpenStack as it builds its community needs to move faster and faster. Uh, so, but this is our, our overall stack. Uh, our compute storage and network are obviously, you know, the physical layer that we have. Uh, we usually refresh this, meaning we get some new generation of equipment every 12 to 18 months. On the OpenStack side, uh, you can see what we're using, you know, pretty straightforward uh, from the perspective of we have compute, uh, we have uh, uh, OS images. Uh, we actually don't expose uh, Horizon right now. Most of our exposure is through uh, API and CLI, and I'll show uh, another diagram later. Um, and then we, we built our own manageability stack. Um, you know, this isn't core to OpenStack, and we don't think uh, you know, OpenStack is, is everything you need uh, to run an open cloud environment, and it probably doesn't make sense for it to, to be everything. Uh, it's good to have you know, other open source solutions in the industry, uh, but to show you some examples, we use a concept, uh, we watch everything, uh, we make decisions, and then we have an actor uh, and then a collector. So, so keep it very straightforward. We're watching the environment uh, from down to the very core infrastructure up through the virtual machines into the application layer. Uh, this is sending events to a bus. Uh, we have a decider, which is basically a, a fairly young child with very uh, uh, basic understanding of, of, of logic. Um, but that's good. That's to start out. This is internal code right now. This is something we would like to see in the industry become, uh, become open source in the near future. Uh, and then we have an actor, which is uh, basically Puppet. This is the thing that, that takes the action in the environment and makes sure that the, the configuration state uh, is the same. Uh, and then recently, uh, a collector, just to, uh, most environments, once you start having to audit it, you clearly need to see uh, everything that's going on, have a, a trail and history of that. Um, we're using Mongo um, and HDFS. Uh, so, so again, on, on the very top, um, our consumers are generally uh, software developers. Uh, so. When we first did our first enterprise private cloud, which has been running uh, since about 2010, um, our focus was initially on application owners. So in an enterprise IT shop, you usually have a lot of people that buy off-the-shelf software and run it uh, on infrastructure. So what they wanted was a GUI, right? But when we uh, made a decision a year and a half or two years ago to do OpenStack, we shifted our focus really to software developers. And for them, what they need is, a, is an API, a CLI. So usually the GUI for us is, is always trailing which is why we haven't uh, even exposed Horizon to anybody but our, our friends and family. <coughs> um, but this is the overall uh, platform solution stack. 
And probably a good point to add on here too is we also do run platform as a service. And so on top of OpenStack, uh, today we're running uh, Cloud Foundry and Iron Foundry and Production Pilot, which are also you know, two open source capabilities. Um, so this is just our current infrastructure app status. We've been running in production, uh, I think since August of, of last year. Uh, we run in, in two data centers and on the left, we see we have uh, the software development type people that uh, hit actually our, our a utility abstraction layer that we built uh, internally, um, which has API and a CLI. And, and the reason for that is, uh, is we, we have to work against uh, not just OpenStack, um, we have to, uh, we utilize public cloud service providers um, as well. And as we all know, uh, APIs are not the same um, and therefore usually need some form of abstraction layer. Uh, we looked at quite a few of them uh, and decided to, uh, uh, we felt that the industry was gonna need to create one fairly soon. Um, and we took the technical debt on ourselves uh, to build a, a API CLI that allows us to basically you know, take the, the normal approaches you would to an infrastructure. I want a provision, I want to change it, and I want to destroy it. Uh, we interact with load balancers, whether it's in the public cloud environment or whether it's uh, hardware load balancers or software load balancers in our internal environment. Uh, we give uh, the framework through the actor to do uh, you know, code package and, and releases. We, we deploy platforms um, into our environment that, that are fully featured. Um, and then the application owners have the opportunity uh, to use things like, like the Puppet framework to push their own code. Uh, in our internal environment, uh, we're running OpenStack Essex today. Uh, and we were, uh, we were about to, uh, to go to Folsom, but uh, after this week, our, our team is, uh, is highly interested in, in bypassing Folsom completely and jumping straight to Grizzly. So uh, we'll probably make a decision uh, uh, within this next week. Um, but for us, with all the advances that happen in Grizzly, um, it's, it's probably the, the right choice to jump forward, but we'll report back uh, uh, at the Havana face-to-face -face on, on Summit on, on what we did. Um, and then just to point out on the bottom right, so we, our, our consumers are either actually end users that need to hit the software, not, not the hit OpenStack, but hit the software that's running on OpenStack. Uh, so these are people that, that work at Intel generally that, uh, that want to get to their apps and data. So uh, in, in some scenarios, they're hitting a global load balancer which basically is intelligent DNS, uh, which routes them to their, their closest proximity. So if they're on the west coast, uh, they end up in one of our two data centers. If they're on the east coast, for instance, they end up at a, a third party cloud. Um, but the global load balancer takes care of that. And also it, uh, it, it helped us uh, start to push forward the concept of, of active active uh, to our software developers so that in reality, uh, we should be able to just shut off a data center completely. Um, and the consumers, you know, going through intelligent DNS are able to, to stay running. Um, one other thing I just wanted to point out, and, and the details aren't really that important, um, it's just that uh, the point earlier that not, not everything has to come out of OpenStack, and I think it's a, it's a misconception that people uh, believe everything is in OpenStack to run an entire uh, cloud environment. Um, I think more and more can come out of OpenStack, but this is just, uh, I did a little bit of color coding, you know, what's, what's core from OpenStack, uh, what's outside of OpenStack that's open source, uh, what's outside of OpenStack that's homegrown today, and what's uh, outside of OpenStack that's proprietary. Uh, so for instance, right now, our approach was uh, to go open source for almost everything, uh, though our application performance management tool is not open source that we use, um, but, that, but that's okay. Um, but the focus that we move forward is basically everything stay open source. And then, as you notice, you know, there's quite a bit that's outside of OpenStack that is open source. So for instance, our web fabric and database fabric is based off of platform as a service solution, uh, Cloud Foundry and Iron Foundry, um, and we don't believe OpenStack has to take care of that. So basically, we have a, a, a layered environment of, of a combination of OpenStack and more um, that allows us to, to run our, our environment. Um, so how many of you are familiar with uh, writing Cloudware applications? How many of you are software developers? Okay. Um, so so fundamentally, there's a, there's a key difference between uh, how IT applications or an enterprise shop, how applications were being built uh, compared to what, how they should be being built. Um, and we call them legacy applications, but unfortunately, uh, legacy applications are, are still being built this week uh, and people are buying legacy software. Uh, but fundamentally, what we're trying to push forward is uh, very similar to what we do in grid computing. Uh, it's very similar to uh, what you'd see, you know, many of the, the shining stars that use public cloud um, how they approach uh, things like design for failure. Um, if you go and look into any depth on, say, how uh, a Facebook or, or Google 
operates their infrastructure related to their, their software, um, it really should start you know, clicking in a software developer's brain on how to actually write differently. Um, so one thing that we do internally now is uh, we do code-a-thons, which are basically a, a one-day session. Uh, we pull a bunch of developers into a room and we walk them through um, how to start building Cloudware applications. So give them access to platforms as a service, give them access uh, to infrastructure as a service, and walk them through some design patterns. So one of them I just wanted to share, uh, which we're, we're pushing heavily, is, is how to actually build to an active, active model. Um, so the assumption here is deploy to uh, you know, N plus one clouds uh, to basically as you add on more environments, more regions, more zones, uh, your SLA for your service uh, should be able to go higher and higher, um, which is uh, very similar to what you see with a lot of consumer apps. I know I saw Gmail was down this morning for some people. Did anybody get hit by that? Nobody got hit by Google Docs down? Okay, those are rare scenarios. Um, they don't happen very often. I think uh, last time I saw Google have an issue was because somebody uh, messed with DNS in some country um, and it went, uh, went up the chain and, and Google then had a, a DNS problem, but it was lo localized in that area. Um, and fundamentally though, it's, it's how they approach building software. If you go inside of an enterprise and you see all the software is built uh, to assume that the server is always going to be on, um, and, <clears throat> and I think as we all know today, uh, that's not necessarily the case if you're dealing with ephemeral storage or if you're uh, dealing with a situation where you don't have uh, resilient block storage. Uh, people often don't write with the concept of eventual consistency. Um, so eventual consistency is uh, you know, opposite of, of causal or where a lot of people spend a lot of money on, on replicating data um, so it's constantly uh, uh, in sync. Uh, we're saying you know, eventually it'll catch up and you deal with your, your code in such a way uh, that transactions are indepotent and, and they aren't hitting um, they're not causing issues by, by hitting into multiple data centers. Uh, today, we, we generally help with the database replication for our teams. Um, as we do more and more platforms of service, uh, we expect they can just get eventual consistency out of the box and, and they can do uh, less focus on, on understanding a deep basis of how those things work. But I think we're far from that. Is anybody in this room familiar with things like Paxos? We have a few nodding heads. Any other hands raised? Yeah, so, so Paxos, so this is like the, the basics of where we want people to go. But if you look at like complex transactions, you have to enable uh, concepts like Paxos, which, uh, which ensure that your transaction is really truly consistent before it returns back to the end user. Um, this has been around for quite, quite some time. Uh, I know Facebook has shared a little bit that they use that. Uh, but it's fundamentally that uh, you can't, if you're really gonna build applications that are global scale, uh, that are truly resilient, uh, you have to think differently um, utilize the cloud to your advantage to, to create and destroy things on demand, uh, but to really start building uh, with a completely different approach. Um, so this is uh, when we shared six months ago, I think I also shared, uh, or I might have left it off, how we compared to uh, public cloud uh, environments. Um, so when we look at the various functions or, or capabilities that we need on the left, we basically say, hey, where are we at with our Intel IT open cloud, uh, our private environment, um, and, and where do we need to be? Uh, so there's still, you know, there was quite a few things in red uh, six months ago. Uh, things are better. It doesn't mean everything's in, in production yet, but we're, we're slowly making, uh, well, actually fairly quickly making pretty strong progress. And, and what we'd like to encourage, you know, others that are either in IT shop or, or are committed to, to helping move this stuff forward is, is look at some of these areas in red and say, you know, what, what can we do to, uh, to accelerate them? Uh, so fundamentally, you know, we start out with the basics. Give me compute infrastructure as a service. Uh, this is through Nova, uh, no change there except, uh, you know, probably moving from Essex to, to Folsom or Grizzly. Um, object storage was a, was a tough one because actually uh, for a lot of software developers, they're not familiar uh, with object storage. Though, uh, I don't know how many of you have read how the NPR apps guys are using object storage today. Has anybody seen that article? They, it's amazing. They have, they have one server that does cron jobs and all of NPR's applications are just object storage. There's, there's no web presentation layer involved anymore. It's, uh, so the point being is uh, innovative things are happening as people are consuming uh, these services at a greater and greater scale. So our focus was get this into the environment as quickly as possible. Um, we're, uh, we have Seth in our labs today. I think uh, that's one, one constant I've heard in almost every talk I've been to about infrastructure. Somebody's trying Seth. Uh, it's working well in our labs today and we intend to uh, get into production um, uh, in the next uh, a month or so with hopefully no issues. We're gonna rely on it for, for two functions. One is as the Swift API backend, um, as well as the Cinder API. 
If you go down the list, uh, there's a couple other areas that are, uh, that are still an issue. Um, auto scaling is a, is a pretty major uh, problem for us. Uh, we have a very basic version working right now where Nagios uh, can tell the decider um, that there's a situation where CPU is being uh, overutilized and tell Puppet to scale out. Uh, we're pretty interested in, in, in the Heat's work, um, though it's not to the point that we can uh, use it for our, uh, our, our hybrid environments. And we would like to see it progress, though. Uh, in the meantime, uh, we're investing in our, our own solution uh, internally, which we hope to be able to share um, uh, hopefully by the next summit. Uh, Nagios, um, so if you're familiar with, with, when I say missing APIs, this fundamentally means that uh, everything must uh, end up being exposed as APIs. Um, we're actually pretty far away. When I say we, I mean the OpenStack community, we're still pretty far away uh, from the level that we need to be uh, with all the capabilities exposed as APIs. Um, it, it's how the software developers expect to operate. And, and I won't name names, but uh, there are public cloud service providers that are, are really pushing the envelope on what's possible um, in regards to uh, the feature set. And, uh, and, but we do believe that uh, you know, OpenStack community is catching up. Uh, this is why we, uh, we, we're, we're utilizing it. Um, and it's, it has a lot of opportunity to move very quickly. But even something like Hadoop, uh, Hadoop has APIs, but if you really want to do some analytics, um, it's not just about exposing Hadoop. It's uh, do you have a place to put your storage? Um, how are you gonna launch your compute? What type of orchestration you have? And I think uh, those of you, you, know, you know, heavily involved in OpenStack realize there's really not even an orchestration uh, mechanism in there. So a lot of us had to uh, look at other tools. So it's really how do you, uh, how do you build an entire open cloud um, that enables many of these capabilities uh, at scale um, and that's uh, competitive with what's going on in the, in the public cloud space. Um, so just back a little bit to the app architectural guidance. This is just uh, some of the rules we have. Um, I also work uh, in this thing called the Open Data Center Alliance, uh, which is basically helping enterprise IT shops uh, move faster to cloud. Uh, one of our uh, peers in that group is Disney. Um, and Disney, uh, they've been doing, uh, they've been a pretty uh, strong pusher in regards to cloud-based technologies, uh, a lot on the private cloud space, um, as well as some of the hybrid. But they, uh, they actually have a white paper out there, so if you're, if you're not building cloud-aware applications today, um, they've published uh, best practices on, on how to approach building Cloudware applications. Um, this is just a, a high level view uh, that we share, but you know, some of these concepts should be getting ingrained in everybody's head now, uh, like design for failure, you know, assume and actively test for failure. Uh, all data centers uh, fail at some point in time, regardless of how many levels of resiliency you put in, uh, everything uh, fundamentally breaks. We had a joke internally, we had a great data center and a squirrel took it out. Um, so, but these things happen, right? So uh, you should always assume failure and, uh, and build your application uh, in such a way. So stateless compute, um, scaling out instead of scaling up. Uh, a lot of enterprise applications only understand scale up. And uh, the problem with scale up is you can only scale up so high, right, until you hit a ceiling. So, so driving a real focus on scale out, which requires also that the application understands much more automation and also requires that you expose as many APIs as possible in your infrastructure um, so you can do tricks like that. Uh, I already talked about eventual consistency. And then the last thing uh, uh, for us is, is the DevOps, um, no ops model. Uh, I, we we kind of stopped using no ops internally because it scared folks. But, but fundamentally, uh, getting a DevOps model in place so people can, at minimum, get dev, dev, developers and operations together into the same room, or better yet, uh, give developers the ability to actually own their code. Uh, we find uh, if they get a page at 2 a.m., about their code, they never get that page again. Um, so I also want to just give some top priority items for us. So uh, we do run an enterprise IT shop, and uh, running an enterprise IT shop means uh, lots of requirements uh, on, on getting things you know, uh, pretty resilient. I'm not telling everybody that runs an app inside of Intel that they have to switch to CloudAware. That's, that'd be ridiculous. Uh, it wouldn't happen fast enough. Uh, I'm sure if any of you work in enterprise space, you probably have some code that was written uh, 30 years ago um, and nobody's touched it and it stays running. Um, so there's a lot of models where we just have to keep the legacy up and running. So we've made a, a cognizant decision that we weren't going to just uh, force everybody to cloud aware and pretend that this legacy environment doesn't exist. Uh, we fully embrace that this environment will exist for a long time um, and we have to figure out how to, how to make uh, OpenStack work in this environment. Um, so. Uh, uh, we do have a list that, uh, that I shared uh, probably a year and a half ago that said here's all the items in OpenStack that we have to solve. 
Um, but see, these are some of the key ones. So fundamentally, block storage. Um, sounds straightforward, but being able to enable something like live migration allows us to uh, do maintenance in our infrastructure and keep that VM that always has to stay up um, online and, and functioning. It gives us that persistent data for the situation where people are not able to change their application code and deal with a, a persistent backend and compute that's stateless. So we're trying to be uh, very pragmatic. I haven't seen this with everybody in the OpenStack community, um, but uh, I do believe if, if OpenStack's really gonna uh, push forward into the enterprise space, you know, some of these underlying uh, assumptions about uh, infrastructure um, and the relationship to legacy applications uh, need to be uh, handled and, and implemented. Uh, federated identity across OpenStack environments and then beyond. Uh, so again, we do believe uh, a hybrid cloud is going to be the norm. Uh, we don't get everything we need uh, from our private cloud environment. We run 68 data centers across the globe. Um, our, our Linux grid is approximately 60,000 servers. So we have a fairly large uh, uh, scale uh, inside of our environment, but there's locations where I don't have a data center. So uh, uh, for instance, if I need to be online in South America in a month, uh, there's no way I'm gonna build a data center uh, in a month. So we utilize you know, public cloud um, as appropriate uh, to consume uh, capacity as well as in some situations features um, that we don't have uh, in, our, in our private environment. Uh, third is a switch away from Nova Network. Uh, so right now we, uh, we use uh, VLANs and Nova Network and, and security groups to, uh, to deal with our, our infrastructure, for our, our, especially for our web apps. Uh, we're pretty excited about uh, Quantum and uh, the shift to SDN, so this will give us a lot of flexibility as well as the ability to, uh, one of our big delays today is just uh, getting our network operations team to expose uh, a VLAN. So it's, it's a human element. And we take a, a, a Pareto approach and basically look at where is, where is there a delay in, uh, in, in human interactions that's uh, causing a delay for our software developers. Um, and networking is a, is a huge element. And, and once we get Quantum Online uh, with OVS and SDM plugin, uh, that'll be a, a game changer for us for how do we expose networks. Not even getting into the uh, very low level SDM stuff, just the high level logical elements are gonna be very important. Um, load balancing. Um, I, I didn't get a chance to go to a load balance as a service uh, talk here this time. I'm hoping that we've made huge strides, but uh, fundamentally there's nothing that operates uh, in, a, uh, in an environment that doesn't use a load balancer, right? Uh, applications that are resilient must have a load balancer. That's how, how it works, whether it's hardware or software, uh, this is fundamentally a, an aspect. And most enterprise shops probably have a lot of hardware load balancers uh, in their environment that they need to be able to uh, get an API in front of them so that they can enable full app lifecycle. So uh, create VIPs, destroy VIPs, uh, add members, et cetera. Um, so this is a major focus for us because it's also a bottleneck in regards to uh, getting, uh, getting these cloudware applications online and completely self uh, resilient. Um, implement Grizzly faster. So another big item for us is rolling upgrades. Uh, for any of you that have uh, done an OpenStack upgrade yet, um, since you don't have a persistent block storage and you uh, may have applications that are not cloud aware, uh, they're generally going to experience you know, some form of downtime um, and we want to move to a model where there's uh, zero downtime, uh, zero business impact. Uh, there's lots of different ways to approach this, whether it's uh, things like anti-affinity in your scheduler so that your applications always end up on different nodes, uh, more intelligence in your orchestration, uh, so that as you do rolling upgrades, you know, you make sure that not every node and behind that load balancer are affected, uh, but fundamentally, uh, how do we uh, really enable true rolling upgrades uh, so that the, the customer, the software developer, and then more importantly, the end user hitting that software uh, never experience a service outage. And then the sixth point is, uh, is what Don talked about with trusted compute pools. Uh, we run a, a lot of uh, high security applications like, like many enterprise IT shops do. Uh, if you look at some of the reasons why people don't use public cloud uh, massively today in the enterprise space or where you're regulated or audited, it's because of uh, security, uh, uh, sometimes performance and, and total cost of ownership. Um, so for us, even inside of our private cloud, we have some workloads that we don't put on a hypervisor. Um, and we actually benefit in a lot of situations running on a hypervisor. So Trusted Compute Pools gives us that, that ability to ensure that uh, our, our sensitive workloads are landing on the right environment. Um, and Dawn didn't talk about this one other feature in it, but, uh, but things like geotagging uh, become very interesting for us too, because uh, we operate in some countries where that data can't leave, right? So when you operate in those environments, you have to make sure that you do some sort of geotagging or you have a lot of manual processes involved to make sure your data 
um, always stays in, in that one location. So these are the, these are the top priority items for us. There, there's more, I'm sure, but uh, I think that's, uh, that's all I had. So we'll, uh, Don and I will open up for questions and if there's any from the room. using the cells capability. Uh, as far as I know right now is uh, cells isn't really ready for what we need. Um, I'll, I'll have to ask my guys uh, later. Hey, Winston, did you look at cells while you were here this week? Okay. Is it ready? It's, <laughs> it's getting a lot closer. I understand. Yeah, it's getting actually, closer. Rackspace is actually using it in right. production right now. So okay. um, that doesn't mean it's ready for you. But. That's right. <laughs> we're very curious on cells moving forward. Uh, when we were all here uh, six months ago, uh, I think even Mercado Libre showed how they have to do a lot of advanced uh, scheduling across their clusters, um, and they would love cells. They had to build their own code to handle it, uh, so the faster it can be done, the better. Question? Open source platform, platform as a service? Uh, yeah, so on top of OpenStack today, we run Cloud Foundry and Iron Foundry, uh, which are two uh, open source uh, solutions. We, uh, we have a lot of .NET developers, so it, it focuses in on, on that combination. Um, but we also, of course, have you know, PHP and others. Can you look at a way to host um, your orchestration layer into your global load balancers? Do you need a space for global load balancers? That's happening. So right now we have very basic uh, interaction, but uh, when we release our, our new internal abstraction layer with orchestration, it'll, it'll configure the global load balancer as well. Right now, somebody actually has to hit it directly uh, to uh, remove a data center. Uh, so, sir, uh, you foresee CSP transmitting or extending into quality network logic? Yeah, I'm not totally sure that that would be appropriate, to tell you the honest truth. That's, that's not really exactly where it goes. I mean, I could imagine that those things might want to access the TPM for some reason. But I really don't see where TXT would necessarily fit into that. We well, I mean, the, the Cisco guy was talking about provisioning services on the client and storage for the storage mm -hmm. as, as the ultimate controller of the world. All right. And that's what I can see it too. So maybe I, I've got um, I, you know, maybe I do too. I, I don't really see it because the t TXT is kind of a specialized, it's really geared towards the boot environment, not necessarily. Don't have a good answer, I'm afraid. Any other last questions? Uh, first, first one up front. Yeah, you. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so I'm not a super expert on authorization, uh, but I'm pretty sure uh, OAuth and, and OpenID have been investigated um, as options. Um, Winston, do you recall what uh, we're, if, we're, if we're leaning any direction on authorization yet for, for hybrid? And if everybody didn't catch that, uh, what we're doing is, is multiple keystones back with OpenDJ uh, to ensure consistency across, at least in the OpenStack environment, that we have uh, connected uh, identities. Our intent, though, is uh, infrastructure service, platform to service should all be in a hybrid fashion, working with federated identity. Uh, I don't think anybody's cracked this nut very well yet, um, but, but it needs to happen. And we also, we deal with the software as a service space, too, where we consume services that are completely outside of this ecosystem. But we also have to have federated identity. So uh, I think there's lots of options out there. It's just we haven't uh, pinpointed the best one yet. Pardon me? Open DJ is like a back end uh, LDAP. Uh, yeah, it's an open source LDAP solution. There was another question in the back? Yeah. <coughs> On auto scaling, I had two questions basically. Um, have you looked at uh, Billing Stack as far as a driver for cost based auto scaling? And the other is, uh, I worked on an app that we did in 
uh, Amazon, and we left auto scale up to the application itself. So it knew if, on, if my load is high and I'm doing this function, I need more servers performing that function, and they can spin them up itself. Yeah, so our, our actual approach is applications should uh, define it themselves, but uh, like at Amazon, you have an auto scaling group, uh, and you set a policy that says monitor for this type of uh, scenario, and then take this action. So that, that's fundamentally what we do today. With Nagios, we look for a, a threshold to be exceeded uh, by CPU. We tell our decider, hey, this has been threshold uh, hit, and check to see if, if everything in that collection is hit. If so, add nodes. So um, that's, I think most auto-scaling concepts work in that fashion. Um, so, so yeah, we expect the application people to set the policy, whoa, <laughs> to set the policy <laughs> and, uh, and to uh, be able to uh, have their application work in such a way that it can auto scale out. But the first question, billing stack? Yeah, so one of the things that we found in Amazon is uh, using their model, we get a, a cost overrun that really isn't justified by the ROI, right? So we need to have a model where we can say this app is only gonna generate this much return, ah. right? How do we cap that? So your, your cost to sales and then, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Unfortunately, not everything we do uh, is associated with, with money, sometimes just altruistic. Uh, but yeah, that's a, that's a good model. Um, in the grid environments, uh, we, we look at job slot utilization, correlate that to giant chip projects, and, and use a wall of shame, wall of fame methods <laughs> to help uh, drive projects to right size. Um, but we do that, you know, when you have uh, 60,000 servers, you gotta be very specific about the percentage of, of information. Okay. I think we're good. Well, thank you, folks. Appreciate thank it. You.